To everyone watching, thank you very much for coming back. Um, and to say thank you, I've brought you this very good episode. Um, this is an exciting one. I'm talking to a family friend called Peter Lowe's, who is a very exciting guy. Started off in Newcastle, yachted over to the Caribbean, and then moved over to California. And then he made the decision to go up north to Oregon. Um, and he's going to discuss how he has cemented his place as a weed mogul and property mogul and basically talk things business california and yeah life so this guy's got a lot of kind of value to share um so yeah i think there's something in e something for everyone in this episode um yeah enjoy was it bishop auckland where you grew up in the northeast yeah it was one 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 of the places uh was was bishop auckland um and then hexham Hexham for a while. Yeah. Which, which school did you go to, Peter? So in Hexham, I went to uh, Queen Elizabeth Grammar School back then. Yeah. Did a year of boarding school. Oh, right. And it's... then before that, I started off at Whitley Bay Grammar School. So, it... so we bounced around quite a bit, yeah. Was Quags a grammar, um, I mean, a boarding school, was it, sorry? Part-time. Oh, right, okay. Um... Yeah. yeah. Just, just sort of, just for uh, people that... Um, I suppose there were probably ten percent of people that boarded. Yeah, um, and then yeah. yeah, so so then obviously going from school, you went to Newcastle Poly. Um, did you not feel like venturing out of Newcastle at the time, or was that kind of down to your grades that you didn't have the luxury of doing so? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, are we live now? By the way. Oh yeah, we're live. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were still. still and I, I, yeah. I kind of enjoy it to be like a bit casual. Do you know what I mean? Like I'd rather it be. Yeah, yeah. Like a bit more conversation. Yeah. Like. So I, I really had, um, I really had aspirations to uh, go to medical school. Oh really? Um, but my grades weren't good enough. My A levels weren't good enough, and I sort of realised that I didn't really like the sight of blood as well. Hmm. So it probably wasn't a good combo, you know, trying to be a trying to be a doctor when you don't like the sight of blood. Yeah, no, it doesn't work, does it? Yeah, so um, defaulted. Somebody said, "Oh, you should become a chartered accountant." So uh, defaulted into uh, going to uh, accounting school, and that's where, you know, my life took a turn. I met some fantastic people, like your stepdad Simon, mm -hmm. Ali, Alistair Darling. Yeah, um, just a just a cast of characters that became sort of lifelong friends. Yeah. Um. So I've got a question written down here, and it's kind of it goes a bit into mindset, but I kind of, I want to ask like, how was going through traditional education um, with like a possible entrepreneurial drive? Like did you, was that a thing that you realized you had at that age? Well, we, we grew up really poor yeah. and I knew, I knew when I got to college that I did not, did not want to be poor. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, the only way to do that is to make a bit of money. And um, accounting to me taught me the basics, the fundamentals of business. Taught me how to read a balance sheet, how to read a profit and loss statement, yeah. and uh, how to basically got to the point where I could analyze a business and and then be able to tell very quickly if the business was uh, a going concern, if it was good, if it was uh, needed help, or if it had potential. So. Yeah, it, it you know it, it. I always felt like um, accountancy for me just taught me the uh, fundamentals of business. Yeah, so and that was sort of just. Uh, I didn't want to be an accountant. Though. I didn't want to be. Um, Simon and I would call ourselves cabbages, or hmm. we were sort of you know accountants, sort of a uh, just uh, ticket bash, just kept in a room and working on ledgers. It wasn't very fun. Yeah, so like I've also got written down here. Did you kind of see? The currency is a, is a tool more than a like an an end goal at the time. Yeah, you know, at the time I I was started working after after I was studying for my articles with uh you know to become a chartered accountant. I was working for a private practice in in um, Bishop Auckland, and it was really it was really a dead end job. I wasn't making much money. It was pretty miserable and. I just thought, gosh, I've got to, I've got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it was it was quite tedious and I just didn't see any I mean I was making something like you know it was less than a couple hundred pounds a month it was nothing yeah and and they were training you training you to be a a chartered accountant at the time so you was you know that was their their way of getting slave labor really yeah uh back then I don't know I think it's a little different now and so I just couldn't wait to uh couldn't wait to get out yeah and uh, when the op- when the opportunity arose to uh to sort of skip town that's that's when I did what was the opportunity how did it kind of appear? well well yeah the way it came about was um you your stepdad Simon and I and a couple of other lads we uh we had gone to the south of France this would have been in probably 1980 I think it was yeah. 81 maybe one on holiday and uh Simon and I spent all our uh, drinking money in the first few days because hmm. okay. we got into a bit of heavy partying. So he and I ended up taking a job in the boatyard and we sanded boats and made money, made our drinking money. And then um, I met these uh, these people that worked on a boat down there that, that skipped a boat and said, listen, if you, you know, we just became friends. They said, we're going to do a, we're going to do a refit on this yacht next year. And if you, um, want to join us we're going to sail it uh you know halfway around the world um you know would you like to join us we're, we're going to leave next uh next year this so is, uh we'll, we left it at that you know and this was to in antigua wasn't it at the time well yeah so the the refit happened in the south of france so what happened was i, I didn't think too much about it and then i, I went back to bishop Auckland, was doing the job i think my girlfriend broke up with me i got injured and i was feeling really down so i just picked up the phone you know it was landlines back then nobody had cell phones nobody yeah. was doing emails and i picked up the phone i called uh ralph who was this german guy who was a skipper of the sailboat and i said does that offer still stand and he said uh, yes can you be here in two weeks hmm. and i said uh and i thought about it for a split second i said yes i'll be there yeah so i just uh and uh was living up in Newcastle at the time, living in Jesmond. Told my uh, mates, everybody, I said, I'm leaving. And uh, they threw a going away party for me, and that was it. That was the last time I ever lived in England. And just said that you said goodbye to student living in Jasmine, was it? Well, I was actually working then. There was a student living with oh, right, I was okay. working. Yeah, I was working and um, just said bye to all my friends. Um, family girlfriend yeah. and uh, didn't know, didn't really know how long I was going to be gone for yeah so but that was 1980 1981 so uh, did you get to the states in the same year no it was the next year next so year. yeah so we uh, we did a refit I lived in the south of France in um, little place called Villefranche sur Mer, which is which is near Nice. Mm-hmm. And we did a refit for six months on this this sixty five foot yacht had to be completely uh, rebuilt. Yeah. So I, I did all these different projects. It was great for me because I'd always sat behind a desk and so now I was pulling apart bits of this boat and sanding things and painting things and so we did this complete rebuilt and then we uh we took off and we sailed um for about another six months, and I ended up in the U.S. Virgin Islands. That was my last port of call. And along my travels, I'd met some people. You know, I met a lot of people from all over the world, but I met uh, some people from California. And um, hmm. they said, uh, you know, if ever you get to, uh, if ever you get to America, give us a shout. Yeah. So I, this one, this one lad, I, uh, I think I called him up. I said, listen, I'm in. Uh, I'm in St. Thomas. And I'm thinking about coming up. He said, "Yeah, come on up and uh, stay. I've got this little little apartment in Long Beach." And uh, then the story gets really funny after that because uh, I was only going to stay for a couple of weeks because I wanted to go up to Alaska. Okay. So I get uh, so I'll, I'll I'll continue with the story if you want. It's uh, yeah. Go so on. I'm I'm I, I'm um, at this bar in uh, I come up to Long Beach, California. I'm at this bar. Um, and uh, this uh, this fella says, um, "What do you you know? What's your story?" And I told him, and he said, uh, "I said, you know, I, I really need to. I'd like to stay here and work, but my visa's running out. I had a 
and what was called a K one working visa. All right. And he said, "Well, I, I said I'm I'm a I'm a lawyer. I can I can extend your visa for you." I said, "Really? Huh. Uh, okay. How much how much does it cost?" He said, "Well, how much money do you have?" I said, "I've got fifteen hundred dollars." He said, "Well, that's funny. That's how much it costs." So uh, being a very naive, twenty four years of age, very naive. I gave him all my money, and he wasn't a lawyer. Um, he was a shyster, nice. and uh, so I had. I thought, well, I was now I'm out of money. Um, I tracked down this fellow. You know, uh, oh, really? he said he said he'd already spent the money. I felt like I wanted to wanted to you know do bodily harm to him, but I just uh, thought, well, put it as a life lesson. Well, you probably, so, probably could have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, he's very frightened when I finally pinned him down because he wasn't wasn't a, a big lad back then. I was playing a bit of rugby still, and uh, so I go to the local gym and uh, at the, with my roommate, and I'm I'm doing a bit of exercise because I've been on a sailboat for years, so I'm pretty fat. Yeah, and uh, and I'm I'm doing a bit of exercise, and I've got an old rugby shirt on. Were, from, you, were uh, you were you living up on the on the sailboat? Was it kind of one of those luxurious yeah boats? Yeah, no, it was a. There was probably four berths on it, and there were four of us crew in it. There was a skipper, the cook, uh, or the chef, and two crew, and I was skipper's mate, as it was called. So, mm-hmm. and uh, the the owner of this boat was a really wealthy Italian guy. Oh, really? And he would just call, yeah, he would just call up and say, "Hey, uh, can you meet me in um, meet me in the Canary Islands?" So we'd sail there. Uh-huh. And he'd say, "Well, meet me meet me in the Greek Islands. We'll sail there." So we sailed all around these different places. And he would he would go down the boat, and he'd usually bring a couple of ladies with him, and then we would just take awesome. off the boat, and he would just hang out there, and then he wouldn't stay very long, and then we'd sail again, and then he'd say, "All right, meet me." in Antigua in uh in a month so we sailed across the Atlantic to Antigua yeah so I never I never really I never met the guy really I think I saw him once so it's pretty much your boat then for the, the time well, yeah I mean it was our boat I mean it was it, it was beautiful it was a beautiful boat it was a a younger a Dutch built boat mm-hmm. it was really tricked out uh, we had the best food uh these German they were all German crew oh, really? and uh I couldn't believe how how much they could drink and eat and how thin they were because hmm. they just they, they would just talk you know they just would start drinking in the afternoon and carry on and uh i would keep up yeah. with them and i i put on a couple of stone and they they all stayed the same yeah so you packed uh, on the pounds and yeah so and then i'm at this gym right in long beach california and this yeah. and i've got a, i've got a gosworth shirt on nice. an old gosworth rugby shirt on and this big lad comes over to me with this accent he goes you play rugby, boy? And I said, well, I did hmm. a bit. He said, why don't you, why don't you play for our team? And he's a big Welsh guy called Roger Rees. And, um, and so he, he was the captain of the local team in Southern California called Belmont Shaw. And they were one of the top sites on the West Coast. So I went and uh, I said, well, I'd love to play rugby. I'd love to play rugby for you, but I don't have a job. He said, oh, I can get you a job, boy. And uh, so he got me a job at the, as a bouncer at a hmm. local sports bar in, in Belmont Shore, California. And that's where it started. I um, I started working as a bouncer, realized I didn't really want to be, be a bouncer because I was getting paid yeah. $6, $6 an hour. I can imagine and in if you LA work, as well. Yeah. It's probably like the oh, yeah. scariest and, place in the world to be a bouncer. Well, this wasn't bad. This was at the beach near Long Beach. The bar itself was owned by an American football player, and he was quite a well-known football player. And a lot of football players would come in there. and But these guys, when they walked in there, they dwarfed me. You know, they were about six foot six and, hmm. you know, 20, 20 stone. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of a lot of college players would come in. So I didn't really want to be a bouncer there because I'd, I'd probably get, end up getting hurt. So I went to, I started becoming a bartender. And bartenders are great because you're, um, you, you make way more money. You've got three foot of mahogany protecting you from all the ponders, so you and can't the, get people and big fights with you. the glass bottle at hand, if you need. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, but it was uh, there was probably thirty waitresses that worked in this place, and they all wore, you know, lovely little outfits, and we we looked like a bunch of dorks, the bartenders, because you've seen what American football referees wear with the black white striped shirts, like a Newcastle, like a oh, no. Newcastle shirt. You had to walk around with a whistle on. 
did you? Well, no, we didn't have the whistle, but we had the shirts and we had to wear the, like the, the black pants. We looked like American football referees. We looked like a bunch of tools. Hmm. Um, but it was, uh, and then, then what happened was these lads would come in every day and they would all just, and they seemed to have a fantastic time. They were all driving these really nice cars and they just didn't seem to have a, a, a care in the world. And I said to, uh, said to the owner, what do these lads do? And he said, oh, they're all in real estate. I said, well, I think I want to do real estate. Yeah. So that's so, how the real estate world started. But so like before we get into that, and like I obviously do want to talk about that, getting to America, um, like what was your reaction to it? And I've said, I've written down here, what was the obvious like cultural difference between that and the UK? And how did you find it at the start? Or was it all just kind of like a fun blur? And there wasn't too much observation, or I can imagine there's like a a twenty, however twenty five year old. Like it must have been pretty amazing being in LA. Um, and did you ever kind of take a second to be like gobsmacked by your situation? No, listen, I was twenty four, right, and I was working as a bartender at a sports bar at the beach in Southern California. And I called up, um, maybe it was Simon, or what, you know, a couple of lads back home. I said, "You don't believe this?" I said. There are girls coming into the bar on roller skates and bikinis, and the they're whole all tanned. And I'm serving retro, drinks. Yeah, mad. yeah, yeah. It was wild. It was wild. And this place, this sports bar, at the time, it was one of a kind because it had four massive satellite dishes on the roof and four huge widescreen projector TVs. And so, at any point in time, they could play whatever game was playing across the world. And they could get it on satellite and it was uh so you'd get 300 people packed in here every night mm -hmm. so it wasn't just like a normal quiet sports bar this place was wild and uh it so it was to me i was oh, gosh this is uh this is fantastic you know i'm i'm uh i'm making good money yeah i'm, I'm at the beach i i was started to uh you know do a train for marathons and triathlons so i was uh I was always outside during the day and then I worked four nights a week. I heard that when you accepted the job as a a boat crew, you couldn't actually swim. So I'm guessing that, you had to take some swimming lessons in there to get to being a triathlete. That is absolutely true. So when I when I decided I wanted to become a triathlete, a triathlete I realized I had to learn to swim. And yeah. so um, I... Um, I had a friend um, who was a swim coach, uh, and he said, all right, I said, I'll teach you how to swim. So he said, jump, let, jump in the water and let me see what you can do. So I jumped in the water, and I tried to swim, and he said, now get out of the water. He said, I can't teach you. I went, yeah, what are you talking about? You can't teach you. But no, you're a lost cause. I said, you're worthless. I can't teach you. I went, don't say that, you, you wanking, you wanker. Teach me how to swim. So we had this sort of. No, two minutes spat and then he, he taught me how to swim and uh, that's how it started so but yeah I was terrified of the water before that yeah so is that when kind of the endurance lifestyle kind of started because I've obviously when I visited you in Oregon I was absolutely uh, smoked in a, a mountain bike kind of I wouldn't call it a race but I definitely came last um, so <laughs> Like, is that when the kind of endurance sport started or has it just been there from a from an early age? And also, like, kind of speaking on the on the sport, I know you did judo as the, um, like, when you're a young teen. And there's, like, a mad statistic because I've done a bit of um, jiu-jitsu as well. And I just think it's really, like, it's just so fun. Um, but there's a statistic, like, there's a huge correlation between people that do kind of um, mix martial arts and become entrepreneurs, like successful entrepreneurs. Um, and maybe, I did, yeah, I did not realise that. Maybe it's that like premeditated kind of way of behaving. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's kind of just like a game of physical chess. Um, well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So I started doing judo when I was about uh, 10 and I was really into it. I got, um, I was, I was re getting really close by the time I was 13 to getting my black belt in judo. And then our judo instructor, um, he died. He had a, he died of a heart attack. So uh, I, uh, I just, I started studying, uh, I thought you were going to say um, your, your headlocks got too good, but yeah, right. Yeah. No, then I, so then I thought, oh, I need to find another martial art because he could the studio closed. So I started doing karate and, um, 
uh, I was studied under a guy called Brian Crossley, who was like a five-time British um, Olympian. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a fourth degree, fourth down black belt. And I started studying with him and um, did that all the way from 13 to about uh, 19. Um, and it was, it was, you know, I never missed a training session that it was really disciplined. Yeah. So maybe that, maybe that transfers into the world of entrepreneurship. I, I didn't really put that correlation together. That's a good observation. Yeah, no, I just saw it and I kind of, yeah. I believed it, um, but yeah. So kind of going back to LA um, and looking past your kind of triathlete days for a second. Um, so you you were working in a bar, and then you got to the point where you were able to open up your own coffee shop called Midnight Espresso. Um, first of all, I, like I, what I'm curious is how did you get the funds? to open up a coffee shop from working behind a bar? Like, I know you said it was good money, but how long did you have to save? Or was there just like <laughs> angel That's investors? a great story too. Oh, no, uh, uh, yeah. The, yeah, go on. Well, there's, so there was, a, there was a bookie that came into the sports bar. I was bartending at the time, right? And um, I was with Julie, my lovely ex-wife, Julie, and we had this idea to open up a, a coffee shop. This was before Starbucks were around. So yeah. I, I, I did a play on the movie. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Midnight Express. I haven't seen it, no, but I heard it was... That's a great. It was a classic movie. I've got a chance. So I wanted to call the place Midnight Expresso. And uh, so I got the name, got the design, but realized I didn't really have the money. So there was, a, there was this fellow that came in the bar. There was a bookie called Art. And I said, um, need some money, so I can lend you some money. And I said, really? Um, so I borrowed nice. $30,000 from him. But he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay me back um, $40,000. Mm. And I want, I want it in cash. <laughs> so um, got the place open and I paid him. Every every um, week he'd come in for his brown paper bag and uh, we got the place going. And uh, the, the, the thing about Midnight Espresso was we, our tag was we would stay open till midnight. But oh, we nice. also opened at 6 o'clock in the morning. So I was completely dogging it because we were working late getting up early i was drinking so much espresso i was just completely wired all the time so you didn't get your fingers broken by the bucky then i'm assuming no i paid them back and i paid them back and full oh that was well that sounds like a bit of a risk but obviously it, it paid off um and like, yeah yeah what was so that was your first kind of business venture how, like, how did that go for you and was that when you kind of realized that you weren't going to be in a like a traditional career path, or maybe you realised that exactly when you were working yeah, at the bar in LA. I've all, yeah, no, I've always said that um, I'm unemployable. You know, if I were to hire me, I'd probably fire me because hmm. I just wouldn't abide by the rules. Um, I keep different hours. You know, I don't like having to punch a clock. I never have. Yeah, but it it went well. Uh, ran it uh, ran it for a couple of years, but it was so much work. I ended up selling it for a, a little bit of a profit. And that's when I um, started in the in the real estate world. It was probably about uh, 1985, I would say. I started working in real estate, and uh, the market was going pretty well. And the market crashed in the late 80s. Oh, really? So, did you start real estate in LA, or was this in Oregon? No, this would have been in a, a place called Belmont Shore, which is near Long Beach, oh, which right. is not far from LA. It's about uh, it's about an hour away from uh, LA. So how did you get into the the real estate business and you saw that group of guys with the nice cars and did you end up chatting yeah. to them and kind of finding out more and did they invite exactly. you into their world or did you kind of have to nose your way in? Well, I try to nose my way in, but one of them, they're very crafty, these fellows, right? So one of them who, this is the guy called, his name was Jerry Scanlon. He drove a red Ferrari. Hmm. And uh, he would just, you know, he, 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 his his claim to fame was he was a stand-in for Warren Beatty uh, in a movie, uh, I think, called, uh, God, I think it was Soap, but he was a stand-in. That was his, he always won, fancied himself as an actor. So I go work, I go to work for him. He said, oh, I'll train you. Well, pretty quickly he finds out that I'm, I'm a sort of an accountant. Yeah. So he then decided, and his books are a mess. 
So I basically spent the first three months thinking I'm going to get training in real estate, sorting out all his books, which were an absolute disaster. So I had to, uh, um, and I realized he really didn't have a lot of real estate going on, but he just needed somebody to help him with his books. So he had free labor once again. Yeah. So there was another lad that, that um, I met some other people then from that first connection of real estate. And I met a guy who was to become sort of uh, my mentor in the real estate world, two guys, Mike Robinson, Steve Murphy, and they had this company called Preferred Investments. And it was just a, it was a riot, great group of guys. And they you know, they had uh, uh, a, a good, a good, corner on the market down there so they had lots of properties for sale and there was lots of you know the phone would ring the market was, the market was pretty hot yeah and, um uh, started figuring it out so kind of like with the property market um like i know you've you're still in it um but in like a, a different way but have you seen the property market change like I, and in terms of obviously it's probably a lot more competitive and maybe opportunity doesn't arise as often as it did then, because they like I feel like the property market now can be seen as like a get rich quick market, um, and it it is like pr- pretty money h- hungry. So is that something that you've kind of seen change in the last few years, or since you started, and how has your kind of experience been with that market? Well, I've been through two two major crashes in the market so i can tell you that the market cycles right mm-hmm. it always it always goes through cycles and it's dependent on mainly uh interest rates and whether or not you know and the interest rates when they start rising it typically leads us into a bit of a recession so when that happens the buying stops um and um the activity slows down so the um yeah the the, the property market will always go through cycles, but they say if you hold property long enough, you know, let's say 10 years or so, it should double in value. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's, uh, but you, we, we could, we could talk for hours about property, but you'd probably be asleep. Yeah. Well, it's cause I, so I managed to get a mentor through university. One of like, one it was probably one of the best things I kind of got from university because I wasn't really getting much from the lectures to be honest. Um, I just I don't know, but I I saw a lot of value in like the mental program, and I remember he I said to him he I, he was just like oh what do you want to do and I was kind of oh yeah I really want to get into property and I'd been to like a property um, event and it was basically just one of those kind of sharks selling mm-hmm. a course. Uh, but I would kind of, I took the bait. Um, but yeah, at the time I was like, I really w- want to get into property. And he was just like, why do you actually want to get into property? Um, because it's not like a very glamorous market, but people kind of romanticize it. Um, and I think people really do. So I just thought I would kind of bring that up. Um, but yeah, so kind of, you said you got into property. How long was it? Um, did you, well, how long did you spend doing property in LA before you took the leap to Oregon. Um, it was so. Uh, it was about ten years. Ten years. So you did like a pretty big stint in uh in LA. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was, um, you know, the the market was going quite well. I managed to uh, buy a couple of properties, and you know, things were quite buoyant. But if you if you leverage into a property, and um, say even back then, if you put 20% down on a piece of property mm-hmm. and the and the market market crashes and adjusts and then all of a sudden you've got negative equity then all, you know people started handing back keys to the banks and well I'm upside down this property and my tenants can't pay rent or whatever and then interest rates jumped in the in the late 80s early 90s interest rates across the board were hovering you know around 14 percent um even higher on uh, private money up up to 20 percent. so the banks got really tight savings and loans crashed and the market did this massive adjustment so um in 1994 my kids um gabby and dylan were uh two and four and i wanted to move away uh from 
that uh, that market. There was a lot of a um, little bit of civil unrest happening in Los Angeles. There had been the, uh, the Rodney King riots and the yeah. O.J. Simpson trials, so things were getting tense. And I just wanted to change. And I, uh, you know, I had I had my sights set on moving to New Zealand. And uh, Julie wanted to move to. Um, um, she wanted to move to Oregon, where she had family. So we ended up moving to Oregon. And when I came to Bend in 1994, the town was really small. There was really little going on in real estate, and I wasn't sure how I was going to make any money. Yeah, like I think it's interesting because you obviously casually talk about like your first deals and property, but I think for someone my age who's like who wants to be an entrepreneur um well I'll classify myself as, a, as an entrepreneur but obviously he was like looking for their first venture I think like the first deal was that something that was a challenge to get into but I and I asked that knowing that you kind of made all the right contacts before you did that deal um but was that like an it maybe it was a pivotal moment in your career and kind of starting the journey and um, like a career that allowed you to be like financially free. So- well, it took a while. It took a while, right? So when I was working in in um, in the LA market, I was uh, a broker, mm-hmm. so uh, just a commission broker. So when when we found a deal, if you sold uh, a property, let's say for um, a few hundred thousand dollars, yeah, you would typically typically make three percent of that. Um, so a three hundred thousand dollar sale, you make nine thousand dollars. You have to give. Um, twenty percent of the house. Um, so after that, you you know, before taxes, you make about seven thousand dollars. But you know, having you know, from making minimum wage, which was about six dollars an hour, to all of a sudden getting a a, a several thousand dollar paycheck. I remember that first check I got as a commission broker, and it just completely, uh, you know, I, w- I was sort of blown away. Yeah, I can imagine that's quite a high commission as well, isn't it? In comparison, to yeah, the yeah, UK. yeah. At the, the, the time for me, it was it was massive. Um, as I just, uh, you know, I was driving a, uh, I was driving a, an old truck, and every panel uh, body on the panel body on the truck was a different color. It was just a complete hmm. uh, piece of crap. And I was able to go buy you should, a, you buy should a see my, car. You should see my Fiat Panda. Oh uh, yeah, the truck sounds nice. Um, but yeah, and like. So I don't want to skip ahead because obviously I didn't realize that you had such a big stint in LA. Um, and so you moved to Oregon, as you said, um, with your kids and Julie. Um, and Simon told me that you were kind of part of these investment groups. Um, and like what I think, what I'm intrigued about is kind of like forming, how did you form such trustworthy relationships like to be in a part of an investment group um and also just like relationships throughout your career how how have you been able to like be so so successful in that because i feel like it is a huge part of success especially as like an entrepreneur is being able to form relationships um and that, like what i've kind of learned from like cold calling people it's that it's like i find it really hard to speak to someone on the phone and it, even if it's in like a mutually beneficial scenario to not feel like i'm like taking advantage of someone or i feel awkward in like kind of getting something out of the situation so how have you managed to form good business relationships like throughout your whole career well my my take on when i was a broker I would I would never do a deal just to do the deal. I would do the deal as though I was representing family, and so I would take the deal very seriously. And so I gained the trust of a lot of my clients. And if you help people make money, typically they'll help you. Yeah. So once I'd made some people some money and found them some good properties which we traded or invested, I I cover them sometimes. Just listen, I found this piece of property. Would you like to partner with me? And they'd invariably say yes. And uh, that was the springboard was just, you know, always trying to help people succeed, help other people succeed. And then your success becomes a byproduct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. And I think, yeah, I've, I've kind of, 
I was just intrigued because I've kind of realised the... Uh, I've just been cold calling some dentists over the last few weeks and realised it's like it's hard and I, I kind of thought I was the only one trying to sell something but obviously I, I haven't been. Um, so obviously uh, real estate and then you started to get into the restaurant business so how did that come about and also I kind of want to ask you um, in relation like why did you diversify at that point um, like was that something that developed naturally or was that like a strategic decision um, at like a certain point in your real estate career? Um, yeah, the way the restaurant thing came about was uh, I had a had a friend when I moved to Bend that he wanted to buy this restaurant and he couldn't afford to buy it himself. So he asked me if I'd partner up with him. And so that's how that came about. It was just pretty innocuous, really. I just... Uh, um, I started that one that was probably gosh in about uh 20 years ago, yeah. Uh, and then uh, there was another fellow that came, came to me several years later, uh, a Mexican fellow who became my partner. And he said, I, I want to start a restaurant, but he said, I don't have I don't have any money, but I have a great, great work ethic, and uh, so. We uh, we decided to embark, do a little trial run with um, with one restaurant. Yeah, and uh, that led to uh, we're up to seven of those now. Wow. So, I think uh, like we we'll talk about your like your marijuana business, and also I want to talk about your kind of new uh, your new projects, and then also like I kind of just want to talk to you like a bit more casually about kind of philosophies and just like yeah but anyway so i think we can't not mention your career um like the marijuana industry um marijuana marijuana yeah and mary jane industry um and so i was gonna ask you how this came about but i know how it came about and so you owned a plot of land and you had an offer put in and you asked the the bidder why they wanted the the land and when they refused to tell you you dug deeper and found out it was to dispense weed and because of that you ended up forming your own dispensary i mean is that a loose description of what pretty happened? pretty close so yeah I, I owned a piece of property and um there was a couple of uh, retail tenants in there one of the tenants went out mm -hmm. and it was uh it was, it was right on the the main drag and bend you've been to it yeah it used to be a little little car dealership and um i put up a felice sign and within three days i had 20 calls from people telling me they would want one to lease it I've not, and i've been in the leasing business for a long time i've never had so much action on a property and everybody wouldn't uh, would say the same thing. Well, it's um, it's medical related, but I can't really tell you what it is. Yeah, and um, and hmm. so um, it, it came to find out that and people were saying, "I'll give you six months, twelve months rent in advance up front," and nobody does that. You yeah, know? and so um, I uh, I just decided to uh, research it a little bit more and found out they were wanted to do a dispensary and it was medical back then it wasn't recreational which means recreational means it's it's open to the public right medical means you can just go in there if you have a medical marijuana card yeah which a lot of a lot of people did not have mm -hmm. so we opened it up as a medical dispensary yeah and um so maybe that's why because i've written down here like what ama what amazes me about the market for for marijuana it was like how clinical it all was and it was like being in the apple store but they were selling weed and i was just yeah, gonna say yeah. like do you think that was kind of driven by like the the weed market wanting to have like a clean welcoming and like introduction to like the the industry do you know what i mean like they're, they're all methodical about it so there's no so they forget the stigmas like do you think that's kind of well that that's a good point but but what i found out of all the businesses i've been involved in the weed business is the most regulated business and the most tax business hmm. of any business i've ever been involved with yeah and so we are governed by in oregon by the what's called the olcc which hmm. is the uh oregon liquor 
Control Commission. Yeah. And, and they, they monitor every purchase, everybody that goes into our stores. You have to show your ID. You, uh, you know, everything is monitored. We call it, it's called from seed to sale. So, you know, everything from seed to sale is recorded, monitored, taxed heavily. And people think, oh, you're in the weed business. You're making, you know, bucketfuls of money, but it's really the most heavily taxed business I've ever been involved with and the most regulated. Yeah. Hey, I found my camera. You found, I found it. my camera. I found a camera. So I can see myself now on the screen, but you can't see me. Yeah. Wait. So can you try for little that? And can I just go to the toilet for two? So like, I'm just going to be. Yes. A Thank you. Yeah. think still haven't found the the button for it well i've got the camera i can see myself on the screen right i can i can see myself uh but um do you see on the like, on the bottom yeah. where you can see the red phone um, yes and to the right there's a little camera button maybe if you click that that might do something there's a so i i see the uh the red phone with the camera button when i click on that it says can't find your camera check your system settings to make sure that a camera is available oh, if well. not plug one in it's fine I've got, I've got a camera yeah all right don't worry um yeah it's uh, cool i'll just put a picture of your face like that. there you go yeah, yeah we'll do some type of animation um and also yeah so oregon's uh decriminalized all hard drugs so i wanted to ask you when you're going to start selling crack or is that like <laughs> something that is gonna no, they haven't way. decriminalized all hard drugs. All they did was make psilocybin um, uh, oh, no. medicinally available, oh, which right, is okay. the uh, active ingredient in mushrooms, magic mushrooms. So the maximum I, penalty for having any drug was, well, supposedly $100. That was just a load of chat. That's not true. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's probably uh, oh, right. ESA, uh, I think it's fantasy land. Yeah. No, it's so so. Really, you know, they they really need to uh, reschedule marijuana because being a Schedule One drug, I think this is a really important topic. A Schedule One drug is supposed to have no medicinal, um, no medicinal uh, properties whatsoever, and we have a tremendous amount of uh, customers that come in our dispensary that are crippled with, um, you know, pain, anxiety. Or they're uh, the cancer patients, and they get you know they have nausea, and they get tremendous amounts of relief from uh, both THC and CBD mm -hmm. uh, and carbon combinations, whether they ingest it, whether they smoke it. Some people are generally sick, so where I've seen it work on um, uh, on people with great effect. So they, they uh, hopefully this next administration will will reschedule uh, from it. From a schedule one, which you know, um, I think um, I think heroin's like a schedule two, really, and yeah. So I mean, it's the you know, it's it's schedule one is right up there with uh, the really hard hitting, hardcore you know, meth and things like that. And you, you know, you can't compare marijuana and yeah to, to hard hitting drugs like that. And I think for for the people listening, obviously from the UK, it's kind of it's hard to comprehend like what exactly the the shops sell like in Oregon and in this stage but like and I keep comparing it to the Apple store but it literally is like there's like it's like so kind of methodical and there's a different weed for different purposes and it's not just like a oh t smoke this plant and see what happens it's kind of like this is what happens if you smoke this or take this dose of this and it's it's a lot safer and like medicinal than people kind of might think Especially when they they're kind of stranger to the 
to the market? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, most of our, I mean, all of our staff, they're really well educated on what the products that we're uh, dispensing. Yeah. And so if somebody comes in right off the street, I mean, we have people come in sometimes in the 70s and have never been to a weed store in their life. And they used to, you know, they said, oh, you know, we went to uh, Woodstock and that was the last time I smoked pot at Woodstock in the 60s or whatever. And then uh, I'll say, you know, uh, I just want something that's really light. Or I want something that will help me sleep. Yeah. I want something for my uh, anxiety. Then they'll get uh, they'll get hooked up, you know. And we um, and just we're, we're, everything is very well. If you edibles, for example, everything's really well dosed out now. The uh, yeah. they've got the dosages down because you know some people say, oh yeah, I ate this marijuana cookie and I was high for days. Well, hmm. that, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it still does happen if you if you're making it yourself. Yeah. Um, like this is a bit of a woke kind of question or maybe it's just like some a point of thought but like I, when I was thinking about the kind of the weed market um do you ever think well you might not but like I just thought about the people that kind of I've, I've been arrested for selling weed and all the kind of in all the lower income neighborhoods or do you know what I mean and so people that have been selling weed um and it's obviously criminalized but then in on the other hand, there's like a group of people that, like yourself, are kind of doing it, um, where it's abiding by regulation and you're able to profit to a higher degree. Do you like? Do you ever kind of think about that? Um, like how? Well, yeah, you know, right is? now, for example, there, there are still people in jail in this country right now for possession of a small amount of marijuana, and yeah. that. Those people, those people need to be, you know, it's becoming more legalized in more and more states. This whole country will be legalized sometime soon. Yeah. And, and so those people, yeah, they really need to be let out of jail. They need to be forgiven. Yeah, they do. Don't they? They, I think it just needs to be loosened out a bit and hopefully they'll find a way. But yeah, yeah. I, I just thought that was kind of, I don't know. I just, it crossed my mind. Um, yeah. uh, Peter, I, I want to talk about your, your newest project tea so that's teaching environmental awareness do you want to introduce us uh, to kind of what it is um like from my understanding it's uh, basically you're spreading awareness um of environmental issues um through things like granting scholarships and basically like kind of widening the concern um if i'm not mistaken yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you sort of uh, described it quite well there. So um, the acronym T, of course, Teaching Environmental Awareness. Our goal is to try to teach people across all ages, all cultures, uh, little things, small changes they can make in their daily lifestyle that will have a huge impact on, on the planet. Because I think you, you know, young people like you are really aware of how bad things are, how dire the planet is right now. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I really believe that people only make informed choices when they're educated. Yeah. So our, our goal is to try to educate people and uh, just, you know, from, you know, single-use plastic to how much they, um, they, they ride the bicycle over, over driving uh, or using, you know, human-powered over motor-powered all the time. Um, just try to get people to understand that we need to get away from fossil fuels. We need to go to solar and wind power. We just need to try to do what we can to stop the increased global temperature rising that keeps occurring um and where did like the idea stem from to start tea it, it, you know it started when i was on the sailboat and i started seeing plastic in uh in the uh, early 80s in the ocean mm -hmm. and i told a really good friend of mine he said what do you want to do you know when you grow up i said i just uh i want to i want to try to do my bit to uh, help the planet yeah. Um, and uh, he said, well, what are you talking about? I said, oh, I just, uh, just spent a year on a boat and it's just, you know, the things are changing. And, and now it has got to a point where we are getting to a very, very close to a tipping point. If we don't reverse things soon, then um, it's going to get really ugly. And you've probably seen David Attenborough's um, latest documentary. Have you seen that? Yeah, I saw that. It's called... Our, our life on on this planet yeah 
Oh, a, a life on our planet. Yeah, it is. It's his sort of testimony, his uh, his witness statement, if you like, and it, it that that sort of boils it all down as well. It's you know he's one of my heroes. He always has been mm -hmm. since I was a young young boy. I, I love that guy, and is um, he's seen it. He's seen things change. Yeah, I, it's tragic what's going on, and it's frustrating as well because, especially as like a a powerless like consumer going to. Um, like going to the shop, so you buy like a pack of carrots, comes in a plastic bag, bananas, plastic bag. It's like everything comes in plastic, um, and it's just frustrating. And you leave the shop with like at least, do you know what I mean? It's just it's so annoying. Oh it's yeah. Like, even yeah, if, yeah. Even if you're aware of how bad it is, it feels like there's no other option. But again, like it, it, it takes a lot of discipline and effort to not. Um, kind of contribute to like the plastic waste and it's annoying because I think a lot of people are willing to sacrifice plastic um, but I think it's kind of like the the firms like Tesco's or the shops um, that don't want to make the, the, the leap because it's just going to kind of shaft their profits but yeah it's a shame and it's annoying so it's like it's good that you've obviously you're doing your bit um and I, I wanted to say like do you get more out of this type of work um in comparison to kind of like your classic um like money driven ventures like is this something that you kind of just find more joy in pursuing well you know from my perspective if we don't have a planet to uh to enjoy things and spend money, we're all we're all buggered. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the one of the great one of the most simple changes a person can do right now is think about eating more plant based foods rather than animals, yeah. rather than dairy and dairy and animals, because uh, it takes fifty times as much water to feed a meat eater, meat eater as it does a uh, uh, somebody that's eating a plant based diet. Did you say fifty and, times uh, more water? Yes, because you you have to grow the grain to feed the animals. Wow! Yeah, uh, and so and so and and you know people that are eating um, you know you know beef cows all day long. You know they they fart while they're eating. They create me methane, and uh, they, you know we're we're just we're raising we're, we're chopping down rainforests in a, in a massive scale just to graze cattle. And once those grain forests are, 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 are raised, once they're leveled, they will never recover. They're good for about two or three years, and then uh, and then it just becomes, you know, uh, dry land. It just gets washed away. Yeah. And uh, so that's that, I think that is the biggest single change that any any of us can do. And you know, I I've been plant based for quite a long time now, and there's such a variety of food that you can have and you've seen a trend i think there's a massive trend in uk right now towards plant-based yeah uh, there is um and yeah i mean there is but what i kind of i've definitely realized from visiting you in oregon like there's a there's a bigger and kind of deeper culture around like health um and i think first of all being aware of health is a massive pillar to then make the decision to be plant-based um, because half of the UK still doesn't know what a healthy lifestyle or diet is so to then go to the extreme of plant-based it's just like I just don't think it's really gonna get anywhere I hope it does but um, I kind of I'm I'm jealous of the the culture that exists um, like in places like Oregon where everything's healthy do you know what I mean it's like an exercise um, like based culture like all the mountain biking all these weird nut bars all the plants all the like the supermarkets that promote um kind of minimal plastic um i just think the culture in the uk it doesn't really exist yet um but hopefully it kind of it'll bud out somewhere yeah, I mean, what I've you know what I've been reading is that the it seems to be on the uptick in the UK, and I and I really hope that's the case. Um, 
more and more people just need to understand that this is one of the ways that we can really help save the planet. And plus, you know, I ask a lot of people, right? I get a real kick out of converting people from meat eaters to um, vegetarians or, mm -hmm. or uh, vegans. And I'll say, well, you, you know, you tell me you love animals. They say, yeah, I love animals. Well, why, why do you eat them? Hmm. And they say, uh, well, you know, it's not really... Well, what it is, it's made convenient, right? So I think it was Paul McCartney that said, if, you know, slaughterhouses had... If slaughterhouses had glass windows, nobody would eat meat. Yeah. Uh, and when you see the amount, insane amount of cruelty that goes on with, uh, with you know, killing, raising and killing these animals. And, uh, and the, I, you know, for me, I really think there's a lot of suffering that goes on. And when you ingest um, that type of uh, food, you're taking on a little bit of that suffering too. Yeah. I just think there's enough, enough suffering in the world. You should need Paul McCartney as the face of tea. Oh that my gosh, it'd be so yeah. cool. Oh my god, that would yeah. change it all. Connect me. Connect me with him, will you? Yeah, I mean, I'll see if I can connect with him on LinkedIn, but I, if I do, I'll definitely send him yeah. in that direction. But yeah, I, I, I kind of, I saw, um, I'm not sure what my kind of opinions on, like, plant, well, obviously I know plant-based diets or I'm aware of, how kind of good, obviously they're good for the environment um but yeah obviously I, I do enjoy meat but i know consciously that it's not a sustainable diet especially for the environment but how how long have you actually been plant-based for well you know um when dylan and uh, my kids were quite young i was um and living in california it was about uh, 10 years mm -hmm. and then when i moved to bend i saw a snuck it snuck back in you know kids were young and um it was it sort of snuck back into my diet but the, the last uh, last several years i've been plant-based yeah and i think we actually got simon simon uh lena that way last time we were over there too he's gone that's we went to a really good restaurant in the lakes that had a fantastic uh vegan curry and he was he was so impressed i think he's still eating them oh that's weird because i saw him eating a bacon sandwich this morning but Oh uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> must, must have been, I don't know, but yeah. So yeah, Peter, like we've got through like the, the list of questions that I like wanted to ask you in terms of all the ones I'd written down, um, and I still, but I still have some like general ones. Um, I know this doesn't sound general, but um, like when I was listening to your last podcast, or like the one you did with those Canadian girls, I heard you kind of talk about like hot warm audiences and cold audiences and like i've like looked into that and i'm like looking into it more and more because i like i don't know that what i'm just like studying that at the moment in my own time as like is your is that something your company is kind of looking into and like for people that are, are listening and don't know what a warm audience is it's like if you were to go on the kind of let's pick a website like um ah uh, Jesus. Right, if you were to go on the Tesco website and look at steaks and then you were to go on Google the next day and look at clothes, you would get an adv advert from Tesco's for steaks because you've been looking at their products and you're a warm audience. So, yeah, yeah, you're talking, talking about sort of lead generation, right, as it, uh, as it uh, pertains to property. Is that what you're sort of referring to? Yeah, Hot like I, I just... Leads I heard, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard you mention it and it's like something that I'm interested in so I thought I'd kind of just you know ask your opinion like what yeah no the, the so the, the sophistication uh with technology right now is out of sight you know a lot of times when you're uh, searching something on on your phone or a browser it all gets recorded uh and there's all these massive servers that are seeing what you like there's a fantastic documentary out right now called social dilemma yeah really. if you ha if you haven't seen it you should uh, you've checked it out yet yeah, no, it's it's definitely a bit, like a lot of people in the UK have seen it. Um, yeah, it's a big yeah. thing. It's good, really good. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the the, the definitely, um, I I for me, you know, I love it when I can switch off. My, I'll be in a place where cell phones don't work, yeah. mobile phones don't work because it's just, uh, um, you know, it's maddening. Uh, we're all so connected uh, through technology all the time, and people are so distracted because. I watch families at a restaurant, family of four sitting having a meal, and everybody's on their bloody phone. Nobody's nobody's talking. I want to talk about like um, 
things like, I, like I know you've been on these retreats where you have gone without food and water for like a few days, and I think that's like so because for me, I think that's like so interesting. Um, but that's someone who's like aware of my health, loves all these kind of weird things um, to kind of stimulate the brain, but like just. Yeah, just like what are your thoughts on those type of things, and like what was your experience with that, and just to describe the situation. Oh, yeah, so what I did was, um, it would have been in, now it was uh, four and a half years ago. I did what was called a Native American Vision Quest, mm -hmm. and um, we went out into the wilderness with a small group, and uh, from that small group we broke off into solo, uh, and we did what was called a solo fast. So for um, four days and four nights he just drank uh, water and on the last night which was a full moon you were supposed to stay open stay up from um, sunset to sunrise and if you're going to have a vision of any type um, that's when it was uh, going to happen yeah and uh, they did this in a, in a wilderness area in southern oregon and it was uh, it was one of the most fantastic experiences of my life yeah, I'm jealous. I I, I want to do something like that. Maybe not the kind of starving myself, but I it's, love no, that. it's good. No, it's good. It, it really? takes you. The the, the 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 human can push themselves so far. You know, there's all these. We 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 put all these. You know, I couldn't do that. I could never do that. But you know, it's you've got. Sometimes you've got to push yourself beyond what's your comfort zone. Yeah. And when you, when you get outside your comfort zone, you start to really understand understand yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like people sometimes they get uh, really sick and almost die. They say it was one of the best experiences of their life. I've I've listened to some accounts of guys that were uh, prisoners of war and, um, and you know, solitary confinement uh, for years and years. And they said, you know, it was probably one of the best experiences of their life. I learned so much about myself. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, kind of coming to an end, like, First of all, um, like just I for people that because you do really live like you bear the fruits of a successful and maybe grinding at times entrepreneur career. Um, so like, what does like so for instance today, what's the rest of your day gonna look like? Um, and like for people that don't know, like Oregon for me, when I went there, it's like such a fun happy place to live and like i hope one day that might maybe i live there too or somewhere like that but like what does a day look like for you peter or, like what, what will you be doing for the rest of your day today the rest of the day you know i do have i mean again it's sunday you know uh but i do have a conference call uh business in about uh, 15 minutes that will be you know probably about an hour conference call then i'll do a i'll do a little uh little exercise maybe yeah and uh and then try to catch up on uh catch up on a bit of uh sport on the tv i heard that um the um i've got a friend who's a kiwi and he's in love with his all blacks and i heard they got uh trounced by argentina so i was gonna oh, really? hopefully watch him yeah so but uh no i'll just um um you know it's getting cold here the we're in between right but the ski season hasn't started yet so we're, it's a bit nasty outside it's hard to be outside right now and there's really we can't go anywhere we're on a we're on a two-week lockdown with with uh covid yeah uh right now oh, so really? all the bars restaurants are closed the gyms are closed yeah uh and and yeah covid's really heating up here so it's uh yeah you don't want to be here right now okay and just like final comments like what advice you have for budding entrepreneurs and just young adults um so my advice would be never never give up on your on your dream and that, that's kind of a cliche one a lot of people said that right but it's true right yeah. so what what the what the human mind can perceive the human can achieve and nothing nothing takes the place of persistence you know you um you just keep uh, knocking at that door you just keep uh keep chasing that dream and it will pay off and i've always found as though the easiest path to get there is help people help people along the way help people around you and i've I, you know i've said it many times it's one of my mantras if you can be one thing in this life just be kind yeah 
You know, the world needs more kind of people. We've got enough craziness, enough shite out there. Yeah. Well, Peter, like, thank you for coming on. Like, I, I really appreciate your time. Um, and I think for people that are kind of interested in business, this will certainly be like an interesting podcast. Um, and I definitely got a lot out of it. So oh, well, good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just felt like was, I was rambling a bit, but uh, it was always lovely catching up with you. And any time that you want to chat again, Ruben, I'd I'd be happy to uh, either be a guest or just have a have a chat uh, when my camera works on my computer. Yeah, that's fine. Just I don't, do a, don't worry. They can do just look at me the whole time. Just works <laughs> just as well. Um, and I think I think we've got a title for the video: "What the Human Mind Can Perceive, It Can Achieve." That. The it's human, amazing. the human can achieve. Yeah, what yeah. the what the mind, what the mind can perceive, the human can achieve. Yeah, that needs to go on a t-shirt. And also the socks yeah, yeah. from Tokyo Starfish. Oh, that, that, there you go. My favorite sock. Like they're better than Nike socks. So we'll get the link in the description for those. I'll, because... I'll get you some more socks. I literally have. It's... We speak now. Like I haven't taken them off for about a ah. week. But yeah. Ah, they're yeah. brilliant. I love the Tokyo socks. I will get you some more socks. I'm trying to get some. Do you like beanies? Do you like the beanie hats? I'll I'll take a bean. I'm growing out my hair, so I'm trying to get it as All long right. as yours. So I think I need a beanie in the meantime. But yeah, mine's down to my buddy. Mine's down to my shoulders now. I look like I'm back in uh, college. It's a pity you couldn't see me. It's ridiculous. It's long. No, I think it's a cool uh, look actually. But you know. um, and then um, yeah, Tokyo stuff is shameless plug there. What so socks? Yeah, beanies. Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. we can only order beanies from Tokyo Starfish abroad, but they also sell marijuana. But you know, if you can <laughs> put one in a sock, I mean, I'll be happy. But yeah. I'll fill I'll fill the sock with a bunch of pot. There yeah, you go. give it a I'll go. go. I'll, I'll go with your Why not? Yeah. Are you an extra large? Extra large these days? Are you extra large. large. Yeah, no, I'm an extra large. We're bulking, right, so right. we'll see. All right, Peter. All right, all right mate. Thank you very all much. Right, mate. All right. Bye. Right, cheers, Bye. mate.